Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to U.S. History Through Film as we look at the last battles of the Civil War. Now, the New York City draft riots um, came just days after the Battle of Gettysburg, um, a great Union victory, and Grant's capture of Vicksburg, given which gave the North control of the Mississippi River. These two battles together um, in early July of 1863 are often considered the turning point of the Civil War. But the Northern armies did not stop there. Um, another Union army based in Middle Tennessee moved down to capture Chattanooga. Um, forces under General Burnside captured Knoxville. Um, and even the oldest town in Tennessee, Jonesboro, um, where there was a strategic salt supply. Although General Burnside was more impressed by his conquest of Jonesboro than Abraham Lincoln was, Jonesboro, upon hearing that Burnside had spent time on this, um, Lincoln said, Jonesboro, damn Jonesboro, uh, a review of our oldest town. Grant himself was soon promoted to commanding general of the U.S. Army and brought back east in March of 1864. He was replaced in the West by William Tecumseh Sherman, a man who would prove, if anything, even more tenacious. Grant and Sherman devised a plan. With the Anaconda Plan's first two objectives completed, the southern coast blockaded to cut the Confederacy off from foreign trade, and the Mississippi seas to cut the South in half, it was time for the third part of the plan. At last, on to Richmond, or at least deeper into the interior of the South. In May and June of 1864, Generals Grant and Lee fought a series of terrible battles in Virginia, in which Grant took far worse losses. But, rather than retreat, after losing a battle, he would simply move to the side and push south again, trying to get around Lee and for, or, enforce, or force Lee to pull back to Richmond. Exactly the opposite of McClellan, who would win a battle and then retreat, Grant would lose a battle and attack again. Now, this cost thousands upon thousands of lives. Grant got a reputation as a butcher, especially after the terrible battle of Cold Harbor. But um, this worked. Grant understood the math. When he first invaded Virginia, he had 123,000 men compared to Lee's 65,000. And Grant knew his men could be replaced, while Lee's largely could not. Eventually, Lee was pushed back to Petersburg, Virginia, an important rail hub just south of Richmond, the southern capital, and Lee would defend this city uh, with trenches and earthworks around the city, uh, almost a uh, preview of World War I. And Grant did not choose to attack these trenches uh, and earthworks, having learned at last um, his lesson in attacking a defensive Confederate position in his last couple battles marching through northern Virginia. Instead, he would lay siege to the city from June 15, 1864 to April 2, 1865. As Grant was pushing into Virginia in the east, in the west, General Sherman began to march toward Georgia, um, hoping ultimately to capture the city of Atlanta an important rail hub, and one of the South's few industrial centers. The Sherman claimed he had, over the course of the war, captured so many cannons stamped Atlanta that he felt that he was fighting Atlanta the whole time. Um, on his march toward Atlanta, he was delayed by General Joseph Johnston, um, now in command of the main Southern Army in northern Georgia, as well as Confederate cavalry forces led by the brilliant Nathan Bedford Forrest and a young Joseph Wheeler. Pretty soon, uh, Sherman decided he would stop relying on supplies from home uh, because Confederate cavalry could too easily raid his supply lines. Instead, he would live off the land, um, eating all the produce of northern Georgia, which would have the added benefit of terrorizing the South uh, by seizing their property to supply his army. Um, and Sherman advanced, although slowly, as Johnston defended Georgia fairly well with the troops that he had, although not well enough to satisfy the Confederate government. Still, um, as 1864 wore on, Sherman and Grant were stalled outside their objectives. 
and Lincoln became worried about his own political survival because 1864 was an election year. Many Northerners uh, had grown weary of the war, especially after the unspeakable slaughter of Grant's campaigns in Northern Virginia. Indeed, if early in the war some people had said the U.S. and U.S. Grant stood for unconditional surrender, as he demanded at Forts Henry and Donelson, um, some said the U.S. now stood for unspeakable slaughter. But while Lincoln and the Republicans were worried, the Democrats were also troubled. Indeed, the Democrats were split over the issue of the war. Some Democrats, while they may not have liked Lincoln, did support the war, and so were known as War Democrats. Others opposed it um, and wanted to bring an end to the war, even if that might have meant recognizing Southern independence. These Democrats, of course, were known as Peace Democrats. There were even some Democrats known as Copperheads, either because of a copper penny with the head of liberty on it that they wore pinned to their jackets, um, or because they resembled the venomous serpent. These were Northern Democrats, mostly in the southern parts of the Midwest, mainly Indiana, although elsewhere, but also in New York City and some other places, who uh, openly assisted the South. Um, in at least one case, plotting to break Confederate prisoners out of prison camps in the North so they could return to fight for the Confederacy. Lincoln wanted to unify the North, and so did not officially run as the Republican candidate, but rather for the Union Party, made up of Republicans and War Democrats. And to recognize the role of the War Democrats and of loyal Southerners in this Union Party, he chose a new running mate, Andrew Johnson of Tennessee, the most prominent Southern Democrat to remain loyal to the Union. The, uh, the Democratic Party that remained chose as their candidate George McClellan, still very popular um, with many Union Army soldiers um, and with many political connections, and it was feared the Army would vote for him, even though he had a platform to end the war, or perhaps because he had a platform to end the war and even if that meant possibly accepting Southern independence. Lincoln, in the election of 1864, um, told voters don't change horses in the middle of the stream. He told soldiers, vote as you shot. In other words, vote against those traitorous Southern Democrats. But he wasn't sure this would work. Um, he wasn't sure he would win. Indeed, many of Lincoln's cabinet advised him not to hold the election at all, but to cancel it due to the emergency of the war. But although Lincoln had occasionally been willing to violate civil liberties by, say, arresting men without warrants um, in Kentucky and Maryland, he wasn't willing to go so far as to cancel the election or even postpone it. Um, and things did begin to change. Out west, by which we mean in Georgia, um, Joseph Johnson was replaced by General John Bell Hood, who had fought very bravely um, at Antietam and Gettysburg, um, Chickamauga and elsewhere, but also been badly wounded um, at Gettysburg, being paralyzed in one arm, badly wounded at Chickamauga, um, losing a leg. Um, but seen as brave and aggressive, he was put in charge of the army um, that Joseph Johnston had been viewed as using too defensively. And he decided he would copy Sherman's technique of invading the enemy country and living off the land, so he abandoned Atlanta, September 1st, 1864, and headed for Tennessee, hoping to force Sherman to chase him. But Sherman let him go. Um, said he, if he wanted to march to the Ohio, he'd give him the provisions to do it. Um, and Sherman moved in um, on September 7th to capture Atlanta. Lincoln finally had some victories to show the American people. Furthermore, Lincoln offered furloughs to many soldiers to go home and vote. He allowed soldiers in the trenches to cast absentee ballots by mail. And Lincoln ultimately won the election of 1864 um, with about 55% of the popular vote, 2.2 million compared to 1.8 million, but carrying almost the entire electoral college. Um, following the election, General Sherman, who no longer needed the city, burned Atlanta to the ground and began his famous march to the sea, uh, marching across Georgia, 
to terrorize the South and destroy as much of their material as he could, and he hoped their will to use what they had left. General Hood, um, in November, um, suffered a decisive defeat uh, at the Battle of Franklin uh, and would go on to lose another battle uh, just outside Nashville, completely obliterating his army, um, which had begun with about 28,000 men and was now down to 2,000. And I have been asked a question in the past, was Hood on drugs? The answer is yes. He was dependent on painkillers, primarily laudanum, which is an opiate, um, following, again, his terrible injuries at Gettysburg um, and Chickamauga. So he may well have been doped up a fair amount of the time. In any case, he did destroy his own army invading Tennessee. Joseph Johnston was put in charge of anything he could scrape up and told to try to stop Sherman, as were other generals in charge of various local forces. But they couldn't stop him. Um, Sherman marched across Georgia and destroying all that he could on his way, um, with no one in the North knowing exactly where he was, him being cut off from communication networks, indeed, often destroying communication networks to hurt the South, cutting down telegraph poles or breaking telegraph lines, um, tearing up railroads, heating the rails over fires um, to get them red hot in the middle, then wrapping them around telegraph poles and around trees where his soldiers called them Sherman's neckties. But then he emerged on the coast in late December and captured the city of Savannah on December 22, 1864, and offered it to Lincoln as his Christmas present. He did not destroy Savannah, um, but in January of 1865, moved north marching through South Carolina. And if his men had been harsh in Georgia, they were even worse in South Carolina, blaming South Carolina for starting the war. Although many blamed Massachusetts and its abolitionists as well, saying they had provoked South Carolina into its rash decisions. But they were in no position to burn Massachusetts. They could burn much of South Carolina, leaving a path of destruction a hundred miles wide burning the state capital of Columbia um, on February 17, 1865. Next day, February 18, 1865, Charleston surrendered to other Confederate forces, um, including some black soldiers um, who were among the first to march into the city. But Charleston was spared the destruction of Columbia, although a bombardment by the U.S. Navy uh, had pretty badly damaged the city nonetheless. March 9, 1865, Sherman's troops moved into North Carolina, um, where they would fight with uh, what few men Johnston had been able to find. Um, and outside Petersburg, in late March and the first couple days of April, 1865, Grant at last made several attacks against Lee's thinly defended lines. Not, not trying to overrun them necessarily yet, but to test them and weaken Lee's forces. And unable to replace the men he had lost, Lee could no longer continue the defense of Petersburg. And during the night, as April 2nd turned to April 3rd, 1865, he retreated from Petersburg. Richmond was evacuated. Parts of the city were burned to keep supplies out of Union hands. Um, on April 3rd, 1865, Union forces occupied Petersburg um, and moved on to Richmond. Lee moved west, but was soon surrounded by the U.S. Army at Appomattox Courthouse. Um, of all his old corps commanders, only one remained, General Longstreet. Stonewall Jackson um, and A.P. Hill and Jeb Stewart had all been killed in battle. Uh, Baldy Ewell had been captured. Um, during the retreat um, of his entire army, perhaps tw perhaps 28,000 remained, although possibly far fewer, as desertions continued every day, and he could not feed the men that he had. And so on April 9th, he offered to surrender to Grant. Grant offered generous terms, allowing all Confederates to go home rather than become prisoners of war. They could keep their horses or mules for farm work, Confederate officers could keep their pistols. Grant even offered rations to Lee's surviving um, soldiers who were starving. 
The surrender formally took place April 12th um, in the home of Wilmer McLean, a man who had moved to Appomattox Courthouse from Manassas, Virginia, where his home had been used as Beauregard's headquarters during the battle there in 1861. Later that month, April 26, 1865, Joseph Johnston surrendered what was left of the Confederate armies in North Carolina to General Sherman and got terms at least as lenient as those Grant had given Lee. And with Johnston's surrender, the war was essentially over, although some fighting continued on into May. The last Confederate general to surrender was the Cherokee general, Stan Watty, who surrendered June 23, 1865, the very last Confederates to surrender in the entire war were the officers and crew of the ship CSS Shenandoah, a commerce raider that had been attacking Union shipping around the world to hurt the northern economy. They surrendered November 6, 1865, having sailed all the way around the world um, from England where the ship was built and surrendering ultimately in the English city of Liverpool. <laughs> 